Johnny Dollar. Hi there, Johnny. This is Jake. Jake Hessler, out here in Kingman, Arizona. Well, hi, Jake. How are you? And how's Worldwide Mutual doing these days? Me and Worldwide Mutual just fine. But it's uh, it's one of my greater Southwest clients got me worried. Well, I wish you'd make up your mind which one of these insurance companies you're really working for, Jake. You want to know the truth, Johnny? <laughs> Let's have it. Neither one of them, really. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to retire and take it easy out here in God's country that I just don't. Why, do you know I myself haven't bothered to get out and sell a single policy in over six months now? No kidding. But as long as those two companies are willing to pay me good money just to head up an office for them <laughs> and to try to keep an eye on the boys they do have out selling for them, well, why not, huh? <laughs> why not? <laughs> Only one trouble. What's that, Jake? Any problems come along, you just guess who gets them jump right spang in their lap. Well, what's the matter with that? Huh? Well, what do you mean? Well, all you do is turn around and dump them in my lap. Oh, well, now, Johnny. Well, it's the truth, you old reprobate, and you know it. What is it this time, Jake? Young fellow that was insured by the uh, San Francisco office. Yeah? Old mine. One of those old ones over toward Lake Mojave. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he's, um... He's up and disappeared. So uh, maybe you can come on out here and see if you can find him. Okay? Well, as long as it means a chance to warm some of this winter chill out of my bones, and as long as I always manage to get in some good bass fishing out your way, and since you're willing to pay all my expenses while I do it... Huh? <laughs> For while you're fishing over at that Lake Mojave Resort? Well, as an old friend of mine by the name of Jake Hessler said just a minute ago, why not? Well, you come out here and, um, and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jake. I'll fly out to Las Vegas, rent me a car, and see you sometime in the morning. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar the Greater Southwest Insurance Company branch office in Kingman, Arizona. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Golden Dream Matter. That's the count item one. 193.49 for a plane to New York then a jet to Las Vegas. Item two, $23 even. That covers a couple of taxi fares, dinner, a good night's sleep at the Hotel Sahara, then breakfast the next morning. Item three is 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I headed southeast through Boulder City and crossed Hoover Dam at the foot of Lake Mead. And again, I marveled at the way man's ingenuity had harnessed the tremendous power of the Colorado River. I headed south on 93. In the town of Kingman, Jake's office is on the main street above the Conroy Mercantile. Tall, lean, lanky, and well-tanned as always, he was wearing a white Stetson cowboy shirt, blue jeans, and fancy boots. Well, now, maybe you will have a chance to get in some fishing over there to Lake Mojave, Johnny. Nothing suit me better, Jake. You know it. You see, the one man who can help you get on the trail of young Kingsley... Kingsley? Myron Kingsley, that uh, young mining engineer I told you about that's disappeared. Oh, I see. And the man who's going to be the most help to you finding out what's happened to him is the manager of that Lake Mojave Resort, Mr. H.R. Pratt. Ham Pratt, I know him well, very well. Yes, I know you do. And the old mine that Kingsley come to investigate the Golden Dream is right close by there. Investigate how, Jake? To see if somebody isn't being took, but royally. How do you mean? Well, some old coot name of uh, Marty Spiller has been selling a lot of stock in the Golden Dream. Uh-oh. Mostly to people who live way back east. Mm-hmm. And who aren't in a very good position to see just what they've bought into. Hmm? Right. Account of most of them, the suckers who fall for that kind of stock promotion are too poor to come out and have a look. I know what you mean. Go on, Jake. 
Well, there's one stockholder who evidently got suspicious and could afford to do something about it. I mean, he hired young Kingsley to run down from Frisco to have a look-see and then make him a report. Uh Uh-huh. Being a client of our company, Kingsley come around to me for directions. I sent him over there, told him to stay at the Lake Mojave place, and, uh, well, uh, that's the last I saw or heard of him. Uh, When was that, Jake? Been a week now. I see. But only three days since Sam Pratt phoned me that he hadn't showed up in his motel unit there. Mm-hmm. Okay, then. As long as Ham is the one who can put me on Kingsley's trail. And I told Ham you'd be over. Good. Then I'll hit the highway again. Oh, excuse me. Hessler. Well, well, we were just talking about... Huh? He sure is. Uh, for you. For me? It's, um, it's Ham Pratt. Oh. Here. Thanks. Ham, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Only pretty good? It, uh, looks like maybe you've made this trip for nothing, Johnny. What do you mean by that? We found young Kingsley. Or, rather, what's left of him. Oh? In the water at the bottom of a deep, old, abandoned mine shaft. Must have slipped and fallen in. I see. Haven't been able to get down to him yet, but... Well, I guess there's not much point in your coming over here now. Ham. Yes, Johnny. Did you say an abandoned mine shaft? Yes. One that's just been sitting there accumulating water in the bottom of it for years. Then it's not one of those that he went to investigate. Well, no, not exactly. Well, maybe I had better take a look. I got back into my car and drove westward across the desert on Route 68 over Union Pass, then down the long 17-mile grade to Davis Dam. But instead of crossing it, I swung right for three miles to Lake Mojave Resort. As I got out in front of the office, Ham Pratt pulled up in his Jeep. Leave your bags right there in your car, Johnny. Come on, we'll use it. I am. Okay, whatever you say. Hey, how long you been packing a gun like that? Well, you know, Johnny, in case we run across some jackrabbits or a coyote or something. Now get aboard. Sure. Or something, did you say? All right. I'll be honest about it. Since I talked to you, I kind of got to thinking about it. Thinking about what, Ham? Oh, about possibilities. Like maybe in case young Kingsley didn't just fall into that old mine shaft. I know what you mean. After all, if Kingsley was a mining engineer... And he was, Johnny. And I mean a practical one, not just a student. He's a good one. He knew his business. Well, then he should have known enough to take care of himself and watch his steps. Right. In other words... Well, do you have any ideas, Ham? Plenty. Like maybe the owner of the Golden Dream, who didn't want it shown up that he was selling stock in a worthless mine? His name is Marty Spiller. He's the sort of character we don't like around here. How do you mean? Hang on now. Not much daylight left, so he'll take a shortcut onto this side road. Okay. Oh, oh, hey. You call this a road? There's an old wagon trail they used to haul stuff in and out with a mule team. Don't worry. This jeep will make it okay. I hope so. Uh, you were going to tell me about... It's Marty Spiller. Yeah, but better wait now until we get to the Golden Dream. Have you ever ridden a Jeep? I mean, really ridden one of them? Well, like everyone else, I've seen pictures of the boys in the Army plowing through mud and sand, jumping over ditches taking seemingly impossible hills in them, and so on. But until you have actually been on one of them, and I mean on, not in, until you have driven across this kind of rugged desert country, (laughs) you ain't seen nothing. 
When the trail gave out as it frequently did, where spring runoff from the winter rains had washed rocks and boulders and sand across it, we simply bounced across the desert, leaping and straddling the stream bed and washes and anything else that stood in the way. Wow! We'd come to a high, sandy hill, and instead of circling it, we'd go right on up the side in low, low gear, flowing only at the top to make sure that there wasn't a sudden drop-off. Then careen madly down the far side, flipping and getting all the way. What a ride! But it finally got us on the main route to the Golden Dream, and the sun was getting low. See her up there, Johnny, on the side of that mountain up ahead. And a couple of the shafts go well down below the bottom of that mountain. Uh-huh. Uh, Pam, don't you think maybe we better get out and walk that trail? It's just a ledge on the side of that thing. <laughs> if the mule wagons could hang on to it, we can't. But now, about Marty Spiller. Yeah, tell me about him. He stopped working the golden dream when the vein ran out in the late 30s. Then, along about four years ago, Spiller came along. And he's done only enough each year to keep his rights. Just what has he done? Johnny, all he's done is grind up and rewash the tailings. You know, the refuse material left over from the original washing or concentration or treatment of the ground up oil. I guess that's the stuff that I've seen piled up outside all these mine tunnels that we've passed along the way, huh? Yeah. Just worthless rock, in which the valuable metal, the gold mostly, has been taken out. I see. Anyhow, by rewashing that stuff now and then, he's been able to back his claim that he's got a working mind. Well, tell me, Ham, has he ever got any worthwhile amount of gold out of those tailings? No, sir. But that hasn't kept him from selling a new issue of stock now and then. Oh, boy, what a racket. Yes, sir. No wonder he'd want to get rid of anybody who'd know and be willing to testify that his mind is worthless. Like young Kingsley. But until we can get his body up and prove, I mean prove that... Ah, uh, uh, now wait, here we are. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. back. Oh, mm. uh, right, let's see. Wait a minute, huh? Isn't that the golden dream still up ahead there? The main shaft and tunnels, yeah. Grab one of those coils of rope and that big flashlight, will you? See a half mile away with that thing? Uh huh? Besides, it's getting dark. Okay. But the hole in this mound over here to the right, you see it with the timber rigging over it? Yeah. Now, come on now. We'll look over the edge. With that powerful flashlight, you'll be able to see the body down there for yourself. All right. Uh, listen, Ham. Yeah? Where is Spiller? Where's he been all this time? Pretty good alibi, I'm afraid. The day after Kingsley got here, started poking around, Spiller apparently left. Apparently, you say? Yeah. Said he had to go over somewhere in California. Hadn't been seen around here since. Now, hang on to one of these timbers and lean over the edge of this hole and look down. With the help of the powerful flashlight, I looked. About a hundred feet straight down in that jagged sided hole floating in the water that filled the bottom of the shaft was the body. Ham was absolutely certain it was Kingsley. So, job number one was to bring it up. Only then could we determine whether he'd been killed before plunging down there, and if so, how? And if possible, by whom? So if you'll lower me down there, Johnny, on one of these ropes... 
You can feed it around one of these timbers for a break, so you let me down I'll easy. Just, uh, just hold everything for a second, Ham. Huh? Look, you're the one with the big muscles, so uh, I'm the one who's going down that shaft. Well, now, listen. No, no, you I'd a lot sooner trust you to lower me properly than I'd trust myself to hold that heavy carcass of yours. <laughs> also, it'll give you the job of hauling up the body and, and then me. <laughs> there you say, Johnny. Oh, it'll serve you right if I make you climb back up. I tucked the big flashlight into my belt, and Ham slowly lowered me into that deep, black, rock-sided shaft. Hanging there on that rope, touching the sides only where there were juttings or ledges was pretty exciting. I was glad the rope was a long one and that Ham was on the other end. Along the way, there were several small tunnels leading away from the shaft. But with the flashlight, I could see that they were only short ones, ending in piles of rubble. Until just before I reached the water... Ham! Yes, Johnny? Hold it a minute! Right! Have you reached the body? No! What? Not quite. But there's a big tunnel. A clear one leading off from here. A big one. What? Looks like it might lead over to the main shaft of the Golden Dream. Not now. Wait. Huh? Let me snub this line so I can lean over and hear you better. There. There we are. Oh, look. Hey! Forget it for now. I'll investigate on the way back up. I'm only a few feet from the body now, so lower away again. All right, Ham, lower away. Hey! Take it easy. Stop throwing rocks down here. Watch it, will you? That one almost hit me. All right, now lower away again. Ham? Lower away, you hear me? Wait a minute. What goes up there? Who's pulling off those shots? The rope. The rope is slipping now. It's slipping. No painless way has yet been discovered to extract money from your paycheck. Probably the nearest thing to it goes with the name of the payroll savings plan. Oh, you might notice a shrinkage in your check the first few paydays, but then something happens. You no longer expect to have that extra cash in hand. In effect, you forget all about it, except for those pleasant reminders that come your way periodically in the form of United States savings bonds. The Payroll Savings Plan, the automatic, sure route to a secure future. Okay, so I cheated a little. When the rope that had been holding me suddenly slackened, it wasn't I that splashed into the water at the bottom of that mine shaft. Nope. It was one of the big rocks at the opening of the tunnel that I'd found down there. One of the two or three I'd grabbed at frantically to pull myself into the tunnel as the hundred feet or so of heavy rope came whipping down past me and I barely made it. I kept the flashlight off so as not to show that I was still alive and kicking. Because then, after the long roar of the gunshots, and then the... Huge boulders were rolled over the edge and plunged down where I was supposedly struggling in the water. Hey, Skyler! Skyler! You still alive down there? Skyler? Okay, man, I'll just have to make sure.
several more huge boulders came crashing down into the shaft. And thank goodness, passed harmlessly by the mouth of my tunnel. But I didn't stick around to count them. Instead, using the light again, I tore on up the long, sloping passageway, hoping and praying it would somehow get me back to the surface. Half a dozen times, I had to clear away piles of rubble with only my bare hands. But I was thinking of Ham, of what might have happened to him, what still might happen to him. Finally, a pile of rubble blocked off the passageway entirely. But then through a low, narrow little side tunnel, so filled with debris where the shoring had given way that I had to crawl along on my belly, I reached the surface. It was quite dark by now, but I didn't dare show my light. Instead, I walked slowly, quietly around to get my bearings. And then I saw the jeep. And above it, the timbers Ham had used to snub the rope were outlined against the darkening sky. In silhouette, I could faintly see two men up there. But in the dark, I couldn't tell which was which. But at least I knew that Ham was still alive. But for how long? Because one of them was carefully tying the other one down to a ten-by-ten ten that lay only a few feet from the edge of the shaft. Had Spiller gone mad? Was he going to shove that timber with its human cargo into that shaft? No Indian ever crawled along over the floor of the desert any more softly than I did. And I cursed the fact that I hadn't a gun, that I'd left it with a hand to cut down my weight. A couple of times a jackrabbit jumped out from under my feet and I hunched over and froze, hoping the man I was stalking wouldn't look around. Or if he did, that he'd mistake me for one of the many boulders scattered about or a clump of sage. But then I came to a clear space, nearly 20 feet of it, that I had to cross to reach him. To reach him before he could shove that timber into the pit. It was so dark now, I could only see him as a blurred shadow. But all he needed was to hear me. Whichever one had the gun. I stopped. Took a deep breath. Then rose up to make the dash across the open space. It's okay, Johnny. What? Just take it easy. Ham. So that tunnel you found down there did bring you up and out, huh? Uh, thank heaven you're okay, Johnny. Ham, the main thing is that you're all right. Except for a bump on the head from the butt of his pistol. Marty Spiller, hmm? Marty Spiller. Sneaked up behind me when I was letting you down there and really laid one on to me. When I came to, I saw him throwing rocks down there at you, so, well, I figured I'd better get up and stop him. I was tying him up just now, then fastening the line so I could work my way down and help you to get back up. Hey, whatever gave you the idea that I was still alive? Johnny, if a lousy punk like Spiller could kill off a man like you, well, this I gotta see. I hope you never do. We brought up Kingsley's body the next morning. The bullet that had killed him before he'd been dropped from the mine shaft had come from Speller's gun. A simple ballistics test proved that conclusively. So again, it's up to the courts. Expense account total: four fifty one eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, as you listen to it, just remember that old saying. Ike and Mike, they look alike. And join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Cliff Carpenter, Bob Dryden, and Sam Raskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Warren Sweeney speaking.